Welcome everybody to another session of Logicals in Quarantena. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Diogo Dias, the represent There is no good argument for logical monies. Diogo, thank you very much for this presentation. <laughs> so, first of all, thanks everyone for being here. And thanks Bruno and Petruccio and the Brazilian Society of Logic for organizing this event during these strange times. Uh, it's nice to have a place where we can discuss what we are doing and what we are studying. Right? Uh, so the title of my talk today is There is no good argument for logic communism. And I know it's a big and bold claim, so I think it's better if I start off with some qualifications for this title. And this is something that I've been working on the past few years in collaboration with Professor Otavio Bueno. So first, uh, philosophical qualification. So from a philosophical point of view, this talk is part of a wider investigation concerning a naturalistic approach to logic or an anti-exceptionalist conception of logic. And that is a conception of logic, which is neither a priori nor topic neutral. Uh, but here, my presentation does not depend on this assumption. So of course, I'm not gonna assume that logic is not a priori nor topic neutral. That would be just preaching to the choir and that's not what I wanna do here. In particular, this means that I won't be giving a general argument against all and every possible conceivable argument for logic communism. And the main reason for that is that I'm just not sure if that's even possible. So my general strategy here today is try to accept as much as I can from the monist perspective and try to show that it can be made compatible with logical pluralism. So the monist argument does not lead necessarily to logical monism. And that's what I mean by there is no argument for logical monism, right? And this leads us to the second qualification, which is a practical one. Of course, we don't have time to analyze every possible defense of logic communism. So we'll focus on three specific cases. Uh, first, a logic communism based on empirical considerations, uh, a defense of logic communism based on a priori reasoning, and another one based on discussions concerning meaning theory. That is that the right logic should arise from the right uh, theory of logical language, right? And these are only three cases, but hopefully my analysis would show how we can extend this, this investigation to many cases of defense of logical communism, right? So I wanna start with some, so as I said, my general strategy is to try to accept as much as possible from the logical communist perspective and try to show that it is not enough to guarantee logical communism. Uh, so before we go into that, I, I want to present some preliminary definitions. During this presentation, I'm going to use a very abstract notion of logic. So logic is just a structure with two components, uh, a set of formulas and a consequence relation defined as usual. And this is a very generic notion in the sense that I'm not imposing any restriction on the consequence relation. So for instance, it does not have to be a Tarskian consequence relation. And I'm also not impose any specific presentation of a logic. So it could be an, an axiomatic form or using natural deduction or any other kind of presentation. Okay. Uh, in the same sense, I'm going to use a very general notion of logical pluralism, which is just the claim that there is more than one adequate, coherent, or in some formulations, even true logic. So there are several ways to adequately characterize the notion of logical consequence. And once again, this is a very general notion because there are different ways to make precise the notions of adequacy, coherency, or even true in this case. One can say that adequacy is empirical adequacy, or you can say that adequacy is adequacy to some a priori criteria, or one can even have a stronger notion of metaphysical adequacy in the sense that a logic is adequate if it mirrors, in some sense, the structure of reality. Uh, my presentation is going to be independent on these particular instances of these definitions. I'm going to try to use whatever notion that the monist in question is using. All right. And the logical monism is just the negation of this. So there is a single logic that accomplishes this task, whatever this task could define to be. All right. So now we can go to our first case, which is an empirical argument. We know that not every defense of logical monism comes from concerning discussions concerning the foundations of mathematics or general questions on language, truth, and reality. 
Some argue that logic is in some sense empirical, and so we should look into our best scientific theory to discover the right logic. And I'm going to use a paper by Putnam from 68. And in, in this paper, claim, uh, Putnam claims that logic is empirical, and so the correct logic should arise from empirical considerations. And the resulting logic is quantum logic. That is, quantum logic is deep right logic. And this move to quantum logic dissolves or solves the common paradox of quantum mechanics, such as the measurement problem or Schrodinger's cat. Uh, we don't need to go into details of quantum logic, especially not into the details of quantum mechanics. I'm just going to give you a very general uh, argument claiming that at least qu classical logic is inadequate for the quantum phenomena. And I'm going to follow the presentation by Buena and Colliban in a paper by 2004. So if you take the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics, it claims that any electron has a spin, which is an angular momentum of plus half or minus plus half, uh, sorry, or minus half in a given direction x. So we can try to formalize this information in classical logic in the following sense. In the direction x, either e is equal to plus half or e is equal to minus half. And this r here is the classical disjunction, all right? Um, another aspect of the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics is the so-called Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle, which claims that it is not possible to measure the spin of an electron in two distinct directions at the same time. So given this scenario, suppose that we have measured the spin of E in the, in the direction Y, and we got the following formula. In the direction Y, E is equal to plus half. So now we can have the conjunction of these two formulas, and we have one uh, in the direction y, e is equal to plus half, and in the direction x, either e is equal to plus half or e is equal to minus half. And as you know, in classical logic, we have the distributive principle of conjunction over disjunction. So if we have that alpha and beta or gamma is equivalent to alpha and beta or alpha and gamma, and now, if we apply the distributivity to this formula one, we get the following. Either E is equal to plus half in the direction Y and E is equal to plus half in the direction X or E is equal to plus half in the direction Y and E is equal to minus half in the direction X. So now we have a formula that goes against the Heisenberg indeterminacy principle. So we, have, we know that one is true, but two is false or maybe meaningless and that's why the distributivity the classical distributivity fails in quantum situations and according to Putnam this is enough reason to reject classical logic and move to quantum logic all right uh, this thesis was widely discussed during the 70s and 80s but the, the debate was mainly focused on the claim that this move to quantum logic solves the quantum paradox and since it was shown that this is not the case and even Putnam came to this conclusion by 94. It was almost a consensus that quantum logic is not the correct logic, maybe not even for quantum mechanics. Um, but there are still some proponents of this idea. And now I'm going to look into a paper by Dickinson from 2001. And he claims that, and I quote, quantum logic is the true logic. It plays the role traditionally played by logic, the no which is the normative role of determining right reasoning. Hence, the distributivity law is wrong. It is not wrong for quantum systems or in the context of physical theory or anything of the sort. It is just wrong. And then he goes on to present his account of quantum, quantum logic. Diogo? Yeah. Are you hearing it me? It looks like uh, the bottom part of the slides are, yes, the, the bottom of the slides are not appearing. Hmm. The bottom of the code, you mean? Maybe should try. Yeah, maybe should try to put it in full screen. Okay. Let's see what happens. Now we have the black screen again. <laughs> yeah. So asking, well, <laughs> that what we can do. Well, I think it worked, right? Can you see now? Not yet. Yes. Now I can yeah. see. It's better now. Okay. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so as I was saying, I'm going to leave out of the discussion whether or not this move to quantum logic dissolves the quantum problems, because this was already highly debated. 
uh, as I claim in the beginning, my strategy is going to try to accept as much as it's possible from the monist perspective and try to show that it's not enough to guarantee logical monism. So for the sake of argument, let's accept that uh, logic is indeed empirical. And the correct logic should arise from empirical considerations. And now we have two different paths that we can follow. The first one, it's also to accept that the resulting logic is quantum logic. Uh, but the interesting thing is that once we accept that logic is empirical, now this proposal is now is subject to some com common problems in the philosophy of science. And here I'll focus on only one, which is the subdetermination of theory by data. In our context, this means subdetermination of logic by data. And what that means is that accepting one, two, and three, it's not enough to settle the issue. There is a further question which must be asked and that is which quantum logic. So we have already the quantum logic proposed by Dickinson, which according to him satisfied the constraints of at least the uh, empirical adequacy. And what I'm gonna show you there is that there are other candidates that can also do the job, right? So the first case is a paper by Kraus and Arendt in which they propose a non-reflexive quantum logic. That is a logic in which the classical notion of identity does not hold in general thus incorporating already in the subject and logic the idea that quantum particles are indistinguishable. Uh, and the motivation for this proposal is a philosophical uneasiness concerning the incompatibility of the phenomenon of indistinguishability on the level of the experimental situations and its formalism using classical mathematics in which we know that any two distinct objects are always discernible, right? So just to give you a very simple example of what's happening here, Imagine that we have two different marbles, one black and one blue, and two diff different boxes. In this scenario, we have four possible configurations. Either the two marbles are in the first box, or they are both in the second box, or the blue one's in the first box and the black one in the second, or vice versa, right? So we have four different possibilities. When you go to quantum phenomena, in particular, when you go to electron, this should this two last cases collapses. So we have no experimental situation or experimental data that is enough to distinguish these two last cases. We can tell whether or not we have two uh, electrons in a single box, and we can tell that we have one electron in each box, but you cannot instantiate these different electrons. There is no property that can distinguish them, and that's why they, they are called indistinguishable. And uh, the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics deals with the situation formulating some mathematical symmetry conditions. And according to Krauss and Arendt, they are tricks just to mimic the non-individuality of quantum objects. And so what they are proposing is just to accept this non-individual behavior and just formulate a non-reflexive logic to deal with this situation. And what matters to us here is that this proposal, this non-reflexive quantum mechanics is also empirically adequate. So we have already two different logics that can do the job. We have quantum logic proposed by Dickinson and this non-reflexive quantum logic. Right. But these are not the possible cases. There's a yet a different instance, the project by Da Costa in the round, where they developed a very consistent quantum logic to deal with the phenomenon of superposition. And in general terms, superpositions means the combination of certain phenomena that generates a new phenomenon of the same kind. So for instance, in classical physics, the sum of two different waves gives us a new wave, and this new wave is completely determined in terms of the initial ones, right? On the other hand, on quantum mechanics, there is no clear interpretation for the superposition of certain phenomena. So for instance, the case of trying to measure the spin of an electron in two different directions, doesn't work in quantum phenomena, right? Uh, so according to Da Costa and De Ronde, the various attempts to deal with this non-classical nature, nature of superpositions have a common feature, which is they all try to avoid possible contradictions. So what they do instead is changing the subject and logic to a per consistent one. So if, if contradictions do arise during the investigation, it does not lead to, uh, to the trivialization of the system, right? So their proposal is a new interpretation of superpositions, which takes into account contradiction as a key element of the formal structure of the theory right from the start. So we have yet another non-classical logic that deals with the 
quantum phenomena, right? And as I said, we, we could follow two different paths, accepting the logic is empirical and the, the right logic should arise from empirical considerations. And now we can also look at this subject from another perspective. And Dickinson himself recognizes that the inadequacy between quantum theory and classical logic also depends on the chosen interpretation of quantum theory itself. So if you change the interpretation and choose, for instance, the brugli bohm theory, or sometimes called the Boomian mechanics, uh, the problem that motivates Dickinson's reasoning dissipates, and quantum theory is once again compatible with classical logic. So very generally, what this theory does is that Boomian mechanics has the same observational data as quantum mechanics, but, but it claims that this data only gives us a partial description of the system. We need to add what is called hidden variables. Uh, and they are called this way because they are not empirically verifiable, but they are imposed right from the start. So they are a, an essential part of the theory. So now the total of description of the system is given by the observational data plus these hidden variables. And this total description now can restore classical logic. So we have a different interpretation of quantum mechanics that now uses classical logic. It's compatible with classical logic, right? Um, so in sum, even if you accept all those premises, there is more than one candidate for a quantum logic. And quantum mechanics is also compatible with classical logic. And another thing that even if a single logic was indeed adequate for quantum mechanics, it would not be enough to establish its adequacy for all domains of reasoning. It could be the case that we, we will need in the end to just add extra connectives to our already classical logic. So even if a single logic was adequate for quantum mechanics, it's not enough to say that a single logic is adequate for all domains of reasoning. Because the argument fails for several reasons. And there's a very nice moral to this story proposed by Bachagalupi. And he says that it is a general lesson in the philosophy of physics that old philosophical claims made on the basis of quantum mechanics turn out to be highly dependent on the interpretational approach one adopts toward, towards the theory. And modeling pushes the argument even further. And he claims that the tale of quantum logic is not a tale of a promising idea gone bad. It is rather the tale of the unrelenting pursuit of a bad idea. And I think this conclusion is a little bit extreme because as a philosophical hypothesis, the idea of a quantum logic is as good as any philosophical hypothesis. It's just not the case that it leads to a logic communism. And that's everything that I need for the moment, right? Uh, so that was the first case, the case based on empirical considerations. Uh, we can pass now to our second case, which is based on a priori reasoning. So one can say that even if some patterns of inference do vary from domain of to domain, there must be a common core between all different logics. And we could call this common core the one true logic. And this is the proposal done by Priest in 2006. And he suggests the following definition. We can say that an argument is super valid if and only if it's valid in all logics. And in the same way, an argument is super valid if and only if it's valid in all situations. And of course, we could formulate a synthetical version of this definition saying that an argument, an argument has a super proof if and only if has a proof in all formal systems. Okay, So if a logical law do fail in some situation, it is not a logical law after all. Maybe you could use it to do some inference and accepting this law as a non-logical law for a given domain. But in the end, it is not a logical law and we fail when we consider it to be a logical law. Um, the problem with this kind of reasoning is that it can easily lead, lead us to the conclusion that in the end, there is no logic after all. And this is the position sometimes called possibilism or non necessitarianism right? Uh, and most, the reason for that is that most is, if not all, logical law was calling to question at one point or another. There is for a given logical law or for a supposedly logical law, there is always a situation in which it fails in a formal system that formalizes this domain. So if you think about the obvious candidates for a logical law, uh, excluded middle fails in intuitionistic logic dealing with constructive situations, the principle of explosion that from contradiction everything follows, fails in paraconsistent logic, deals dealing with inconsistent situations. The principle of identity fails in non-reflexive logics, for instance, in quantum situations. 
the existential introduction and universal instantiation fail in free logics, and for instance, dealing with fictional situations, and so on. So maybe in the end, the one true logic is empty. Maybe the intersection between every possible logical law with some kind of application is empty. Uh, and it's, there is a very obvious and highly repeated reply to this kind of reasoning, which is just the famous Quinean reply, that changing the logic implies changing the subject. So when we say, for instance, that classical logic and intestinistic logic disagree about the excluded middle, they are actually talking about different subjects. So the, in the end, there is no rivalry, no real rivalry between different logics. And the problem with this reply in this situation is that either there is no super valid argument. So if, it's, if we accept that changing the logic implies changing the subject, we, can even, we cannot even talk about a common intersection between all logics. So there is no super valid, there are no super valid arguments. Or the other possibility, all valid arguments are super valid and now with, with respect to its own domain. So we can say that every logic is universal in its own domain. And in, it, in this case, every logic is universal and talk about all possible situations, but only when it applies. And this is what Shapiro calls tutelist monism, because it's a very strange kind of monism and does not give us much from a philosophical perspective. Um, so either way, the argument does not lead necessarily to a logical monism, right? So this is the a priori argument trying to claim that indeed we have a, a one true logic and a, as I try to show that the argument does not succeed in establishing the, its conclusion, right? Uh, and now we can go to our final case. And before that, I wanna present some more definitions that I'm gonna use. As I said before, a logic is just a structure with a set of formulas and a consequence relation. And we can define as usual, the consequence set of a set of formulas gamma and it's just the elements of, it's just all the formulas that are deductible from gamma in the logic in question, right? And you can say that a set of formulas is consistent in L if and only if its consequence set is different from the entire set of formulas. Otherwise, this set is L inconsistent. And we know that a logic is explosive if and only if from a contradiction everything follows. And when this is not the case, we say that a logic is paraconsistent. Um, and now the, the next definition is going to be highly used from now on. It's something called paraconsistentization of logics. And this means the process of turning an explosive logic into a paraconsistent one. The term was coined by Professor Alexandre Costaletti from the University of Brasilia. And this was the top that he suggested I should develop during my PhD. And this is what I did. I tried to develop a few methods of doing that. And everything started by studying a specific part consistent logic proposed by Newton da Costa. And I'm just gonna show for this particular case how this works and this will help us to, to have a bigger picture of how we can do that for any given logic. So take for instance, classical logic, right? Composed by classical formulas and the classical consequence relation. We can say that uh, gamma is classically consistent if its consequence set is different from the entire set of formulas. And now we can define a paraclassical logic in the following sense. Uh, the set of formulas is exactly the same as the classical ones, and the consequence relation is defined as follows. So alpha follows paraclassically from gamma, if and only if there is gamma prime subset of gamma, which is classically consistent, such that alpha follows classically from gamma prime. So the basic idea is that we are taking the classical consequence relation and constraining it, and restraining it to the consistent subset of the original set of premises, right? So it's just a restriction on the consequence relation from the initial set. And we can easily see that paraclassical logic is indeed uh, paraconsistent. So take gamma, for instance, to be P and not P. Uh, its consistent subsets are the singleton P, the singleton not P, and the empty set. And of course, we cannot derive classically Q from any of these sets, and therefore we cannot derive Q paraclassically from gamma. So this proves that paraclassical logic is indeed a paraconsistent logic, right? So what I did is that I realized that the, the classical constraints, 
the classical constraint on the definition of our classical consequence relation does not play any essential role. So we can just modify the classical constraints for any constraints to a given logic L. So we can define the consequence relation of a part of whatever logic as uh, alpha follows in this para, para consistent version of a given logic, if and only if there is a subset gamma prime of the original set of formulas. And this set is consistent in, in this original logic such that alpha follows from gamma prime in this original logic, right? And the way that we do that is by changing the usual notion of deduction. So now I'm gonna use an axiomatic presentation of a logic. It has nothing essentially to do with an axiomatic presentation of a logic. It's just easier to apply para constantization to an axiomatic presentation of a logic, but there's nothing essential in this procedure. So we could do the same using natural deduction, for instance. Uh, so take now a logic to be a set of formulas, a set of axioms, and yeah, a we'll finite family of inferences. Yeah. We have a uh, question. Yeah. Uh, what does it, from Petrusio, what does it mean L constant? Uh, just means that this, it means that this set, let me just go back. Um, L consistency means that the consequence set of the set is different from the entire formula. So consistent in this very abstract way is just non-triviality. Right. So here we have the classical notion of consistency. And what, what, what I'm saying is that you can generalize this to consistency in any given logic. That only means that this gamma prime in this logic L, uh, the consequence set of gamma prime does not infer every formula. This is what I mean by consistent in this context. Is that clear? Yeah. Um, Okay, thank you. So now, given a logic using this axiomatic presentation with the usual notion of deduction, there is a deduction is just a finite sequences of formulas such that each formula is either a premise or either an axiom or follows from previous formulas via some inference rule, right? So given a logic with this notion of deduction, we can formulate the notion of para deduction. And a power deduction in L from gamma is now a finite sequences of pairs, right? And each pair is composed by a formula and an accompanying set. In the following sense, each accompanying set is consistent in the original logic. And for each formula in these pairs, either this formula is a, is, belongs to the set of premises and its accompanying set is the singleton of this formula. Either alpha is an axiom on the original logic and its accompanying set is empty, is the empty set, or alpha is an immediate consequence from previous formulas in virtue of the application of the inference rules from L, and its accompanying set is the union of those sets used to infer these previous formulas. So once again, what we are doing here, we are restricting the, the deduction of the original logic to the consistent subparts or subsets of the original set of premises, right? So we are keeping the rules of inference and we are keeping the axioms, we are just restricting the application. So what we are saying is that before applying a deduction to a set of formulas, make sure that this set of formulas has a subpart or a subset that is consistent. In the case where the, the set of premises is itself consistent, the two consequence relations are equivalent. Right. And now we can use this notation to say there is a part of deduction in L from alpha. Uh, so this is how we do part constantization from a synthetical point of view. We can also do the same from a semantical point of view. I'm not going to go into those details because it's not interesting now for what I'm trying to present now. What matters is that uh, this part constantization has some nice properties. So for instance, if the original logic is sound and complete, its power consistent version will also be sound and complete. And also, power constantization preserves theorems. Actually, it's more stronger than that. The theorems are the same in the original logic and on the power consistent version of this logic. 
So in this sense, we can say that the paraconstantization preserves some core features of the original logic, right? Um, in, in a few moments, I'm going to show how we can use this to counter another argument in favor of logic communism. And the argument that we are going to analyze here is Dummett's defense of intuitionistic logic as the right logic. So we all know that Dummett argues for intuitionistic logic as the right logic, at least for mathematical reasoning, and thus demanding a revision on the logic subjacent to mathematics. Uh, but the conflict between classical and intuitionistic logic is not merely between the acceptance of different logical laws. It's very common to say that the only difference or the, the main difference in between those two logics it's, is with respect to the excluded middle. And in fact, there is a much deeper disagreement between them. And the real reason why, and I quote them, it, it is possible to call a basic logical law in doubt is that underlying the disagreement about logic, there is a yet more fundamental disagreement about the correct model of meaning. That is about what we should regard as constituting an understanding of a statement, right? So Dummett's thesis is that classical logic is wrong because it is based on a wrong theory of meaning. And in particular, the classical meaning of the logical constants is incoherent. A true theory of meaning must be based on what the, the so-called manifestability of language. So to know a sentence is to know how to use it, or, or put differently, every aspect that is relevant to determine the meaning of a sentence must be publicly manifested. And hence, if two individuals agree completely about the use to be made of the statement, they, then they agree about its meaning. And according to Dummett, the theory of meaning subjacent to classical mathematics fails to account for these constraints. For it, and I quote, it requires that the understanding of a sentence consists in a knowledge of the con condition for it to be true. There is, in an awareness of what has to be the case for it to be true, we must possess an understanding of quantification over an infinite domain, which does not relate to our own restricted means of recognizing as true sentences formed by such quantifications, but does yield a conception of truth for such sentences as, as something which they determinately either do or do not possess. So the problem is that when we have a universal sentence applying to an infinite domain, classical logic demands that or dictates that these sentences do have a truth value, even though we are not in a position to determine this truth value. And according to them, it, this fails to satisfy these constraints of the manifestability because there is some aspect of this sen sentence, which is its truth value that is transcendental to our ability to actually discover it or at least de uh, determine it, right? So the principle, in particular, the principle of bivalence is a transcendent notion, according to Dummett, right? So Dummett is proposing a revision on the logic subjacent to mathematical reasoning, but that is only possible if one also rejects the holist approach to language, and that is the idea that the meaning of every statement is given by the connections with other statements. Hence, changing the meaning of some statements would imply that changing the whole language. And the solution is to adopt what he calls a molecular approach to language. And this is, and I quote, a view on which individual sentences carry a content which belongs to them in accordance with the way they are compounded out of their own constituents independently of other sentences of the language not involving those constituents. So in the specific case for, for a theory of meaning of logical context, uh, constants, the solution is to replace the central notion of truth for the notion of proof. And so this means that to know the meaning of a mathematical statement is to be able to recognize a proof for it. And here the molecular view plays an essential part. The proofs of complex sentences are given based on the proofs or the, of their simple constituents. And the meaning of the, in particular case of the logical contents, this means that their, their meaning are, are given by their proof conditions. Uh, but Dummett stresses that not every case, it's not the case that every set of rules determines the meaning of a logical connective. So for instance, if you take Hyping's suggestion on how to define implication, he defines as such. The implication alpha implies uh, the implication alpha implies beta can be asserted if and only if we possess a construction R, which joined to any construction proving alpha, would automatically affect a construction proving beta. In other words, a proof of alpha together with R would form a proof of beta. 
And Dummett claims that this definition is problematic because since there is no restriction on the proof of alpha, the definition itself could be secular for alpha could be another implication. Uh, and the solution, according to Dummett, is to distinguish between proofs in general and canonical proofs. So canonical proofs are direct verifications of a sentence, while proofs in general are indirect verifications that can be transformed in canonical proofs if needed. Thus, the meaning determined proofs are the canonical proofs. Um, Dummett his, himself recognizes that he, he can, he's not able to give a precise account of what it is, uh, canonical proofs. And we know now that there are several different ways that we can make this notion precise. And I won't, I won't go into these details because it's not relevant for my point now. I'm just going to assume that the logic that Dummett proposes satisfy these constraints because in the end, this is the constraints that he himself are proposing, right? So these are all the constraints that Dummett imposes on the development of the right theory of meaning. It's a bit of language, the molecular approach to language, and the, that means that the meaning of logical constants are given by their proof conditions in terms of canonical proofs. And the result is intuitionistic logic. And usually Dummett presents intuitionistic logic using a natural deduction approach. I'm going to use an axiomatic approach just because it's easier, as I said, to apply the paraconstantization to it. But there's nothing essential with respect to the axiomatic approach, right? So this is the axiomatic system that Dummett proposes as being the one true logic that follows from these constraints. We have 10 axioms and the only rule of inference is modus ponens. So this gives us the intuitionistic logic that we define using the, the previous definition of logic. And now we can obtain the bar consistent counterpart of intuitionistic logic. And I don't know, we can, maybe we can call it para intuitionistic logic. And we can define it as such. The set of formulas is exactly the same as the set of formulas from the original formula. This guarantees that we are using the same language. And the consequence relation is defined as follows. So now alpha follows parentistically from gamma, if and only if there is gamma prime subset of gamma, which is consistent in intuitionistic logic, such that alpha follows intuitionistically from gamma prime. So once again, we are restricting the consequence relation of the, the intuitionistic logic to all the, sub to the consistent subsets of the set of premises. And we do that just changing the notion of deduction in intuitionistic logic, or better put, just defining an, a new notion of power deduction in intuitionistic logic as a finite synthesis of pairs. So each pair is a formula in an accompanying set such that all the accompanying set are consistent in intuitionistic logic. And for each formula on each pair, either this formula belongs to the set of premises and the singleton of, and the accompanying set is the singleton of this formula, or alpha is an axiom of intuitionistic logic is one of those 10 axioms and its accompanying set is the empty set, or alpha is an immediate consequence from previous formulas in the sequence in virtue of the application on, of an inference rule, and in this case of modus ponens, and its accompanying set is the union of all of those sets used to infer these previous logics. So once again, we are restricting the notion of deduction to the consistent subsets of the original formula. And uh, what I'm claiming is that this paraconsistent version of intuitionistic logic satisfies all those constraints that Dummett imposes. So the right logic should arise from consideration concerning the theory of meaning. We are respecting the manifestability of a language. So to know a sentence is to know how to prove it, or better yet, to recognize a proof for it. And we have the molecular, molecular approach to language. The proof of a sentence is reduced to the proof of their parts. And the only thing that we are changing now, we are adding a further restriction, which is before applying this before applying a, a proof, make sure that the set of premises has a consistent subset, right? And the meaning of the logical constants are given by their proof conditions uh, in terms of the canonical proofs. So as I said, I'm not changing the rules of inference. And I'm just saying that before applying modus ponens, make sure that a set of premises has a, a consistent subset and then apply modus ponens to this consistent subset. 
when the set of premises is consistent, both logics gives us the same result. So I don't think it makes sense to say that the meaning of the logical constants changing changes when we apply the same rules to a consistent set and to an inconsistent set. I don't think it makes sense to say that the consistence of the set changes the meaning of the logical constants. So that's why I'm, I'm claiming that the logical constants are the same for these two logics. So we can accept all these constraints and the result is that we have at least two different logics and Dummett's intuitionistic logic and what I call a power intuitionistic logic, all right? So Dummett's argument is not enough to settle the case in favor of a logic communist. Um, and as I said, this power intuitionistic logic preserves some nice properties of the original logic. So for instance, uh, preserves all theorems and it also rejects the excluded middle. Uh, so in conclusion, we looked at three different defenses of logic communism from an empirical perspective, from an a priori and linguistic perspective. And I showed that the linguistic and empirical defense is compatible with logical pluralism. And that means that you can accept a big part of their argument and it is not enough to, to settle the issue in favor of logic communism. And the a priori defense that we looked at the proposal of a notion of super validity, super validity can lead to logical nihilism, to the conclusion that in the end there is no logic after all, right? And I hope that this investigation can give us some strategies to deal with some different arguments for logic communism. So in the case of the empirical considerations, what this means is that usually there is some, some problem concerning philosophy of science that we can apply to any kind of trying to defense the try to defend the adequacy of a single logic based on empirical considerations. And in the case of the a priori reasoning, we can try to show that this criteria is not enough to result in a single logic, all right? So that's what I had to present today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diogo. So now we have some time for questions and interaction, comments. Uh, as usual, I'd like just to ask you to manifest it first in the chat, just to avoid a lot of people talking at the same time. Marcos, would you like to talk or that I read? I think I'm going to stop Marcos, the presentation okay. so I can see everyone, okay? Sure. So, Marcos says thank you. And the discussion of logical monism pluralism very often uses normative vocabulary, e.g., legitimate correct logic, to present the conflict. But normativity is not central to propose solutions to the conflict. To handle normativity in a monist background seems to be easy, as any deviation is wrong or non-logical. But how to deal with the normativity of logic in a pluralist view as yours? Thanks, Marcos. That's a very interesting question. And this is something that I've been dealing with since I started to, to think about pluralism. And this is, has something to do with what I said in the beginning of the presentation, that this is part of a bigger investigation concerning the possibility of, formula, of formulating a non-anti-exceptionalist view of logic. So what I think is that uh, logic is plural in the sense that different logics can, uh, can be applied to different domains. So I think it's a kind of domain plurality of logics, right? And that does not mean that even for each domain, there is a single logic that does the job. But I do think that the logic should, should be should be evaluated according to different domains. So in this sense, the normativity of logic comes from the domain investigation. Uh, so for instance, if, what, if you are trying to, to investigate quantum domain, at least in, in some interpretation of this quantum domain, classical logic is not adequate. Uh, so the normativity comes from the domain of investigation. If you are thinking, for instance, if, if we take the domain of, um, if we take the domain of informal reasoning, for instance, the, the reasoning that we do on a daily basis, classical logic is clearly not adequate for that because no one uses the principle of explosion when we are discussing. When someone falls into contradiction, no one claims that now I can derive the winning, the winning lottery ticket and I can be a millionaire, right? 
So this is not adequate for the domain of investigation. So I think that the normativity comes from the domain of investigation. Uh, and it's not the case that every domain gives rise to a single logic, because as I tried to show, the quantum domain can be made adequate with a few different logics. But there are some logics that are not adequate with quantum, the quantum domain. So I think the normativity comes from the domain in question. Right? Hopefully I, I was able to answer your question. Uh, Luis Carlos? <clears throat> yes. Uh, I think, Jobo, thank you very much for, for the talk. Uh, really, really interesting. It's a very, very short question and probably a very stupid question. Uh, I wonder, uh, in fact, two questions. I wonder what is the relation between uh, the para-intuitionistic para logic that you obtain from your process of para, para I don't know how to work. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, from your process, right, and uh, minimal logic, for example. Now, if you thought about uh, what is the relation between, because minimal logic is a logic that is para in the sense of it doesn't have the uh, explosion uh, rule. So uh, I wonder if the process of making intuitionistic logic para consistent. Uh, how is it related to minimal logic in a certain sense? I'm, I'm thinking about the chains of logic. Is it is yeah. it placed it somewhere? Uh, can we compare, for example, because you said that the theorems of intuitionistic logic are still theorems of, uh, of para-intuitionistic para logic. You lose something. You lose explosion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you probably lose the the, uh, the disjunctive syllogism, I would guess. Yeah. You would not have the disjunctive syllogism. So you lose many other things. Uh, so can, can we really compare, I mean, the result of the process with what we know, for example, from other logics? I mean, placing in the chain of logic somewhere, is it comparable to minimal logic? Is it weaker than minimal logic, stronger than minimal logic? Now, how, how can we compare? And the other thing, you, you, you did your process using an axiomatic approach but uh, I would really, really uh, wonder what happens in natural deduction, for example. How would, I mean, the para-intuitionistic system look like in natural deduction? Okay. I think, I think, again, thinking about the relation between intuitionistic logic and minimal logic, that you have to make interesting changes in the rules of implication. The rules of implication could not work as yeah. they work in the case of intuitionistic logic. They would have to be different in a certain sense, right? So uh, it is. It would be interesting to see how the introduction rules for the para intuitionistic operators that you have now how they look like, in order to see how these introduction rules could determine, in a Dometian sense, the meaning of the logical operators. Thank you. The, the question was too long. Thank you very much. No, <laughs> those are very good questions and. With respect to your first question, I haven't yet studied into, I haven't yet looked into how to put the paraconsistent version of a logic in the hierarchy of the logic similar to, to the initial ones. So I, I don't have a, an answer for that yet. For now, I was just interested in, in comparing the paraconsistent version with the original logic. But you are right. I think that it's something that I should look into that because it has to be somewhere in the hierarchy. And hopefully it's at least comparable. I, I think it is, but I'm, this is a work that has to be done. And, and thank you for and, pointing to that. And because if, if it is, I mean, I mean, I'm just guessing, but if it is yeah. minimal logic, it would be incredible, right? That your process of uh, eliminating explosion and other things that are related to explosion produces minimal logic. No, yeah. So it, would be, be it, yeah. it would be fantastic in a certain sense. Yeah, that's true. So I, I, I will definitely look into that. And thank you for your suggestion. Uh, with respect to your second question, uh, I just use it axiomatic approach because it's just easier, it's cleaner, it's very immediate what I'm doing. And when I try to do the same with uh, natural deduction, as you predicted, the rules just become clumsy because I have, for, for every rule, I have to impose some restriction concerning, I have to make sure that the set of premises are consistent, so it's just it's just a mess. I mean, it can be done, but it's I I, think I start working with that and I realize that it's just a mess, and, and I abandoned the project. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. But I mean, there is nothing in principle that 
prevents us from doing that. I, I just don't think it gives us a nice, clean, and beautiful presentation of a logic, but it can be done. In some sense, it's similar to tenants' core logic. I don't exactly. Know. I was thinking about that, yes, yes. Yeah. Because he imposes some some restriction on, on each inference rule, and I have to do something similar to that. And I, th I think I'm afraid that he loses compositionality. Yeah, yeah. Page. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Diogo. Thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Otavio? Hi, Diogo. Uh, Hi, thanks, for the, thanks for the great talk. I really like it. And um, so I have just a, a couple of questions. Um, one is a sort of a following up on uh, Marcus's qu question about normativity. I think you're right in emphasizing the importance of the domain to extract the normativity. Uh, and I think the idea that you can push there is there are certain things about the domain that make certain moves in a logic mistaken once you apply them, right? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, of course, that's a highly context dependent feature. Um, and, but the idea would be, well, if part of your goals when you're trying to make sense of how to process saying inconsistent bits of information um, is to avoid triviality, Obviously, a logic that is unable to do that would just be mistaken. So exactly. that that's, that gives some normativity, right? Similarly, if part of the, the, the constraints when you're applying a logic uh, in a quantum domain is to preserve uh, quantum theory, at least some of the salient features of it, uh, then for the argument you gave earlier in the, in the talk, uh, it looks like classical logic would be inadequate, or at least a distributive logic would be. Yeah. So, so in that sense, I think you can illustrate how the normativity arises in a way that it's not different from the way that the monists would argue. Because the monists would also point out, look, it's a mistake to infer, say, everything out of a contradiction if you're trying to, um, to get uh, a hold of uh, inconsistencies. So, in, in that sense, I think the only difference is that the, the pluralist would allow for more options than uh, yeah. than the monist, right? Yeah, and I think it's also important to say that even if we accept this context sensitivity, it is not enough to guarantee that every domain has a single logic that is adequate to it. It could be the right. case that a, a given domain could have more than one. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. So my, my second uh, uh, question is, uh, of course, the title an announces that there are no good arguments for logical pluralism, right? So you show that there are several uh, no <laughs> good arguments. Now, how do you get to you know, an argument that would show that any other argument would follow in one of those categories? Or you need some completeness uh, to justify the, the claim in the title, right? Yeah, I mean, as I said, this is part of this general notion of logic, which is not topic neutral or not a priori. So I don't think I can come up with an a priori reasoning against every possible conceivable case in favor of logic communism. Uh, I, I try to show at least the, the three common cases in the literature for defending logic communism. Mm -hmm. And I, in the case, for instance, of my analysis of quantum logic, it depends highly on the interpretation of quantum logic. But I think that this analysis can give us some clues as to how to deal with other kinds of, of defenses of logical monism based on empirical considerations. So if one, you can use, I don't know, if a, if a different logician claims that there is a right logic for, I don't know, astronomy or something, it, they're going to use some specific notions of simplicity or empirical adequacy. And all these notions are subject to some counter arguments or at least some counter maneuvers that could make it possible with a different situation. This is basically the central case of the philosophy of science that you can always manipulate the theory in a sense that it's gonna retain empirical adequacy and you're gonna change it, whatever aspect you want from the theory. Uh, so in the case of the, I think in the case of the empirical consideration, this is most, this is the, the easiest case to see how we can expand to different ones. Uh, 
I think the harder case is the one based on a priori reasoning because there are many different a priori reasoning to defend logic communism. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is there is no I don't think there's a general recipe that can show how to transform what I did for Priest's proposal to any given proposal. I'm just trying to show I try to cover different bases and show that it's possible to expand this to all. But it, right. in some sense, it's an inductive <laughs> reasoning. Right. Uh, if I can, just one uh, follow up on uh, on the empirical case. Um, of course, you're right. We can always maneuver things uh, to accommodate some piece of empirical data. It's just that some, of, depending on how this maneuvering is done, it may we may have independent reasons to rule it, rule them out. Right. So, for example, the kind of uh, and the determination um, that can be provided uh, just by doing some logical tinkering uh, with yeah. a scientific theory and introducing some disjunction. So here, here's another theory that is underdetermined with the other one. But then we have good reasons to rule those out, right? Because there is absolutely no uh, additional evidence posited for, uh, for those, uh, those versions. So, so I think even in the, the empirical case, uh, we may need to consider um, the details so that it's yeah, actually yeah. a genuine alternative, as, as is the case with the Bohmian mechanics, for example, right? It is, in fact, it's not even clear that that's a different interpretation of the theory. Mm -hmm. I think Bohm would like it to be a rival theory. Yeah. Just that, it, you know, didn't find evidence for the quantum potential, uh, exactly. but... Um, but those are the kinds of alternatives that uh, yeah, want yeah. to be developed. Yeah, so I think in, th in this case, we have to look at a case-by-case -case analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I, I just think that from a very general point of view, it, it, we don't have a certainty that it's, it's always possible to eliminate all different cases and just remain with a single final result for, for that specific right. domain. So Thank I you. think that this presentation is not actually a, a strong advocate for logical pluralism. It's just showing that the argument for logical communism has some serious problems. Right. Good. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Any other question or comment? So, uh, Petrucio? Yes, uh, Diogo, thank you very much for this talk. It was really interesting. I am trying to extend your notion of a paraconsistentialization, maybe, yeah. of a logic. May you put the slide back to that point where you define it, please? Sure. Just give me a second. Let me go back to it. This slide, you mean? Or... Thank you. Yeah, right. yeah. So you have a, a logic defined by a, a relation, a consequence relation, let's say. Yeah. Okay? And you are defining a new consequence relation based on the previous one. Yeah. Okay? And to, to apply this new uh, consequence relation, you need to test if the given set of uh, formulas is consistent. Is that has right? Some, or, or no, the, the, this set must have some consistent subsets. The original set does not have to be consistent, but you, you're going to use whatever consistent subsets of this original set. Ah, uh, OK. OK. So, so basically, what, okay. what we are doing is that you take the set of premises and you analyze every possible consistent subset of this set, and you see what we can infer from each of these consistent subsets. So I, I gave you a, a generic example here. So if you take classical logic, for instance, and take this given set here, just P and not P. First of all, you look at all the consistent subsets of gamma, and here we have three consistent subsets, and we analyze what we can infer for, from each one of these. But in general, you are not imposing the finitude of this set gamma. No. It can be any set. Yeah. 
So you you not be able to do that. I mean, for some logics, for for the majority of logics, it will be very impractical to do that, if not impossible. Why do you say that? Because how you test uh, what what happens if you don't have a inconsistent a, a consistent subset? Uh, mm -hmm. You need to check. I mean, I just thinking. I, I don't know exactly what what I am thinking, but it seems that you have to test if the set has a consistent set that helps you in the producing of a proof. Yeah, if you don't not have this... Test, not, no, just, no. not just test if it, if it has a consistent set. It should be a particular consistent set. Yeah. Is, is this easy to do? I, do, I, I don't know. I, no, I, I mean, from a, from a computational point of view, this can be, this can be very complex. For, mm -hmm. Right. And of course, uh, it, it works when you are dealing with some small set of premises, but it, it can be tricky once the set is once the set gets bigger, right? Or, or infinite, yeah. Yeah, or infinite, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah, no, it, it's a nice point. According to the complexity of the the set of premises, the consequence relation resulting from this method can be even more complex. And this is also something that I'm gonna try. I'm trying to look into that. If we can calculate the complexity levels of these inference relations compared to the original mm -hmm. logic. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's this a good question. That, yeah, this is gonna be interesting to to look into. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but thank, thank you very for, much. Thank you for again. I'm sorry about this messy question, but I just no, no, no. It, it's a good question. It's one that usually arises when. We are dealing with this kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question or comment? So thank you very much again, Diogo. Very it was much. really nice talk. <laughs> thank you.